Hi, everyone. Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me to talk to hear about Seinfeld, I should say, today. Um, I wrote a book called Seinfeldia, and I'm going to talk to you today about kind of the creative journey that Seinfeld took. And we're also going to watch some clips because the show is much funnier than I could ever be. And it's much more fun that way. So um, I'm assuming that if you're joining us or watching this, that you are a Seinfeld fan. Um, it is, of course, one of the funniest sitcoms ever made, but it's also far more special than that. And that's why I was able to write an entire book about it. If you really think about it, Seinfeld pulled off a truly unusual combination of feats when it was running on NBC in the 90s. And I believe that these are also the reasons that uh, it has remained a major hit in reruns and now streaming in the 30 years since it first premiered. Um, it has had a great life now on Netflix. I am rewatching it on Netflix currently, believe it or not. Um, it's been a little bit since I did the entire thing. So uh, going back to that again, and it is always funny no matter how many times you watch it. But Back in its day, uh, Seinfeld was almost canceled at least twice, depending on how how much you you know how how you count almost canceled. But it went on to run for nine years and change television comedy forever. What's really unique about it, it is that it was regarded as kind of unassailably cool, but it was also a huge hit, which is pretty rare. Usually, you know, stuff that's cool isn't as popular and vice versa. Um, but just to give you some numbers, it averaged 38 million viewers in its last season and 76 million watched its finale. Just for comparison, only 19 million people watched the Game of Thrones finale in 2019, which was kind of like, I think one of our last big, big, big finale events. And that would be half of Seinfeld's regular weekly audience. So numbers have changed dramatically in television, of course, but Seinfeld had a particular power. Seinfeld managed to walk the line between edgy and accessible, and that made us all feel like we were the only ones in on the joke, even though there were 38 million of us watching every week. Tonight, or today, I should say, um, I want to take you through the five main ways that I believe Jerry Seinfeld and his friend Larry David, who created Seinfeld together, managed to pull off this TV magic trick. So the first one is that they had faith in promising opportunities that were presented to them even when they didn't yet know where they were headed with it. One of my favorite quotes that I include at the beginning of the book is that Jerry Seinfeld once said, Seinfeld is something I learned to do because I was given the opportunity. Then the show spiraled off into this whole other entity that I knew I had to serve because it had its own desire to be something. And you really see this in the ongoing life and world of Seinfeld. So taking us back to the beginning, when NBC first approached Jerry Seinfeld and asked him if he was interested in creating his own show, he said yes. He had actually no idea how to make a TV show and he had no ideas for a TV show, but he saw that this was you know, the moment. This was the prime opportunity, so he said yes. And then he figured out how the heck to make a television show. What he did next is that he went to his friend and fellow comedian, Larry David, who had written for Saturday Night Live and a similar show called Fridays. So they figured, you know, he figured at least this guy has, has written some television. I trust his judgment. I like his humor. Maybe we can figure something out together. And in fact, together they made Seinfeld which actually took some time to evolve into the show that we know and love now. If you go back and watch the first few episodes, you'll see that they're really still finding their footing. It's not the same kind of structure. It's much slower. 
the characters aren't quite there yet. Um, I've just been rewatching these early episodes and, um, you know, George is giving Jerry dating advice, which we know later makes no sense because Jerry always has a beautiful girlfriend and George is the one who has trouble. Um, the first one, Elaine, isn't even in it. So there's just, they're still kind of like figuring it all out. But, you know, it's actually one of the beauties that you can kind of watch it evolve before your eyes. And it also shows you that they were really figuring it out too and just kind of making it up as they went along. Um, but, you know, they wouldn't have had the chance to do that if Seinfeld had just said, no, 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 I don't know how to make a television show when, they, when he was first approached. So the second thing that they did is they really leaned into their superpower. So once Jerry told Larry about the sitcom opportunity, um, he did this at a comedy club one night where they were both performing in 1988. And so after he told them about it, they spent the rest of the night together wandering around New York City talking about it. And one of their stops was a Korean deli where they kind of, you know, walked through the aisles and they were riffing on the unusual products and foods and things that they were finding on the shelves. Um, you know, Korean jelly, things on the, the sort of hot table uh, where you can, you know, make your own salad or make your own dinner, um, that sort of thing. And if you've seen either of them, which you probably have, um, perform or even interact with each other, you can kind of imagine the scenario um, that they're just good at kind of riffing on these things and especially together. And at some point, Larry said, this is the kind of discussion you don't see on television. And he was right. If you think about that time, the big shows were shows like Golden Girls and Cheers. And those are both excellent shows, of course. And, but they're really classically situation comedies. Um, you know, it's a situation and then the comedy comes from it. Here's four women, older women living together in Miami. Here's a bunch of goofy characters hanging out at a bar in Boston. And the humor kind of comes from that. So Larry really was right. There was nothing like him and Jerry on television. And that is how the idea of two guys talking about everyday stuff became the starting point for Seinfeld, which, you know, they eventually named themselves the show about nothing. And this is really where that idea comes from of a show about nothing. It's not about nothing. It's more like talking about stuff, everyday stuff. And I always like to say, of course, that two guys talking really isn't a show for most of us. It's when it is someone like Jerry Seinfeld and Larry David putting those words and those characters vows, that's when it becomes a real TV show. Not everyone could pull this off, but they these guys, these guys really could and they saw that. So this was kind of them really leaning into that superpower of theirs and um, you know, starting to polish it up. Like I said, I feel like we definitely see this evolution as it goes forward. So with that, I am going to show you a clip. This is from when, this is a show called The Pitch. Uh, and this is when within the show, Jerry and George, who is kind of a stand-in for Larry David, go to NBC to pitch a show that is just like Seinfeld. So what have you two come up with? Well, we've thought about this in a variety of ways, but the basic idea is I would uh, play myself. I... <laughs> oh, go ahead. I think I can sum up the show for you with one word. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing? Nothing. What does that mean? <laughs> the show is about... Nothing. <laughs> 
Well, it's, it's not about nothing. No, it's about nothing. Well, maybe in philosophy, but even nothing is something. Mr. Dalrymple, your niece is on the phone. I'll call back. Uh, D-A-L-R-I-M-P-E-L. Not even close. <laughs> is that with a Y? No. <laughs> What's the premise? Well, as I was saying, I, I, I would play myself and uh, uh, as a comedian living in New York, and I have a friend and a neighbor and an ex-girlfriend, which is all true. Okay, but nothing happens on the show. See, it's just like life. You know, you, you, you eat, you go shopping, you read, you eat, you read, you go shopping, you read. You read on the show? Well, I don't know about the reading. We didn't discuss the reading. <laughs> All right, tell me, tell me about the stories. What kind of stories? Oh, no, no stories. No stories? So what is it? What did you do today? I got up and came to work. There's a show. That's a show. <laughs> How is that a show? Well, uh, maybe, maybe something happens to you on the way to work. No, 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 nothing happens. <laughs> something happens. Well, why am I watching it? Because it's on TV. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> So, um, so that is the pitch. And I would like to say that, you know, of course this is based on their experience, but it is a very heightened version of what actually happened with them. Um, not sure they were quite as clear about, um, this idea of the show about nothing. And I know that they did not call it the show about nothing back then. Um, and certainly we see, we, I do not think we ever saw them read on the show, though that would be very funny. Uh, but this is, you know, kind of this funnier, heightened, like I said, version of what went on behind the scenes. Um, they're really kind of retelling their own history here. And it's how we got the show about nothing. That's what everyone called it after that. And in fact, most of the people involved with it sort of came to regret that um, just because they didn't really realize how much it was going to stick and you know it isn't of course a show about nothing um it's a show about everyday life like i said and i i honestly think this is a huge reason why people still really love it is because it's not that it's about nothing it's just about um you know it's about everyday struggles and the irritations of everyday life and I think that's why we all love it so much because life is very irritating and this gives voice to that. And so it, it may not be about something in the sense of something like Grey's Anatomy where it's, you know, life and death situations all the time or a law show where, you know, people's lives are on the line, that kind of thing, um, which is what most of drama is built on. But they are so funny and particularly so good at, um, you know, those kind of everyday observations that they were able to make this the basis of their show and kind of go from there. Um, so that is, that is what the, they started out with is this idea of the show about nothing. And, you know, this was their pitch. So um, with that, uh, I will move on to the third thing that they did which is that they really found a champion at NBC. After they had kind of, you know, talked it over, come up with this show about nothing, um, even after all of that, Seinfeld would have died an early and quiet death, if not for a guy named Rick Ludwin, the executive who oversaw late night and special programming at NBC. Um, in fact, in that scene that we just watched, uh, it was so based on their own experiences that they cast a lot of people who looked very similar to the people who they were working with at NBC, particularly uh, the president who is named Laura, Warren Littlefield in real life and was Russell Darlum, Darumple on, uh, on the show, the guy we saw there talking to them about their pitch and really looks a lot like him. And also sitting on the sofa, there's a guy with kind of little glasses and I think we're gonna see him again in another clip. Um, he looks a lot like Rick Ludwin. They changed the names eventually. They actually had originally planned to have their real names and then just because they were gonna end up doing some crazy stuff 
with the characters later as they are want to do. Um, they decided to change the names, but um, really kind of tried to tried to make it like, you know, as as close to their experience as possible for for those in the know to to at least laugh along with them. Um, Rick Ludwin had been the one to initially recruit Jerry Seinfeld because of Jerry's stand-up. So it was very common, you know, um, you stand-ups would be on a lot of the late night shows and then networks would see them, see that they were doing well and recruit them for television shows. And so Rick Ludwin was the one who approached him and so Jerry then, of course, as we know, created the show with his fellow stand-up, Larry David, and they eventually shot a pilot episode. Ludwin ended up barely getting that show made. And that was, at the time, it was called The Seinfeld Chronicles. Um, and they actually did not even order a full season. It was just one of these, like, dead in the water pilots. Um, I guess they liked it just enough or just needed to fill a space that they put it on the air in 1989 on the day after July 4th. So July 5th, 1989 is when this one episode only of a half hour of Seinfeld premiered. And if you know anything about television, I would say even now, but certainly back then when it was much more traditional schedule of fall to spring and then summer would basically basically be off and you'd have reruns and occasionally things like this like these sort of you know pull it off the junk heap we're not going to use this but put, we can put this one thing on the air um so it's the dead zone of summer you know day after a major holiday when everybody wants to be outside really just a dumping ground for you know four shows and it was expected to end there but Rick Ludwin really loved it. And he argued for more episodes. Specifically, um, he kind of went to his bosses and said like, I really think there's something here. And they said, well, if you can figure out how to use your own budget to make it happen, knock yourself out. So what he did is he got four more episodes the following summer, which he financed by cutting one Bob Hope comedy special from his budget. So I'm sure it's not precisely this, but essentially two hours of Bob Hope, you know, got them four half hours of Seinfeld. And that was when, so once that went on the air, which was the following summer of 1990, um, still not a prime spot, still not, you know, necessarily expected to take off. And four episodes is like a bizarre amount that you never see, but this is what they had to work with. And really, surprisingly enough, it was then that Seinfeld, they had shortened the name by that time, actually got some traction. And um, that was partly because they were airing after uh, reruns of the show Cheers, which was like the biggest thing at the time. This was when NBC was constantly worried about how they were gonna replace this huge juggernaut that was Cheers. And they obviously did not think it was going to be Seinfeld because they didn't even want it. But it turned out they started to see like, oh, actually the, the Cheers audience is sticking around to watch this weird little new show, these four episodes. And that was enough to get it to 12 episodes the following year. So now we're at a kind of like a half a season, half a traditional season. And finally, around that time, Others at NBC besides Rick Ludwin saw that it had potential. And of course, it eventually went on to be one of the most defining shows of the decade. And I think one of the most influential shows of all time period. And of course, it soon became popular enough that they could make this plot line that was about the making of itself about the making of a show that was just like Seinfeld. And they could, like I said, tell their story, use a lot of the stuff that had happened to them in this. So we're gonna watch another clip.
And this is where um, they are auditioning people to play the roles of themselves and their friends, not Jerry. Jerry will once again be playing himself in the fictional version of this as well, but they're looking to cast the others and they're doing a bunch of auditions to cast people. And this is where you will see the guy with the glasses um, who looks very much like Rick Ludwin and is basically supposed to be him. What's going on? We're, we're going to shoot the pilot and then it's going to be on TV the following week. Yeah, right. This is Mark Matz. He'll be auditioning for the role of George. Hey, Mark. Hey, Mark. Hey, got it. Get it. This guy's perfect. Hey, let's read this. I'll be reading Jerry's part. Anyone call for Vandalay Industries? No, why? Listen, I told the unemployment office I was close to a job with Vandalay Industries, and I gave them your phone number. So when you answer the phone now, you've got to say Vandalay Industries. I'm Vandalay Industries? Right. What is that? You're in latex. What do I do with latex? No, you manufacture it. <laughs> This is Michael Barth, another George. Hi, Michael. How are you doing? Thanks for coming here. Everything all right? I just came from the podiatrist. Yeah, I got some off my foot. I got a little gangrene. They're probably going to have to amputate. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, yeah, well, what are we looking at here? I mean, is this guy like a real loser? No, not a loser. Uh, let's start with the second scene. You have it there? Yeah. Okay. A man gave me a you know, massage. <laughs> <laughs> so... He uh, he had his hands, you know, and uh, he was uh, he was what? Uh, he was you know, he was touching and rubbing. <laughs> That's a massage. I think it moved. <laughs> so Shannon, hi. Hi. Melissa uh, is reading for Elaine. It's like a bald convention out there. Already in football. No, he didn't. He knows he's bald. The guy wearing sweatpants. I mean, did he do that for the parties? He walk around like that. Okay. <laughs> Shall we start? Uh, you know what? I'll read with her. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, want to start? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> what was that look? What look? That look you just gave me. I gave a look? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'd like to see some more Kramers. <laughs> Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Good. What is this about? Levels. <laughs> Levels. Yeah, get rid of all my uh, all my furniture, all of it. I am building levels. The steps are completely carpeted. <laughs> like ancient Egypt. I don't know how you're gonna be comfortable like that. Oh, I'll be comfortable. <laughs> Good. Very nice. Tom, that was terrific. Sure. Thank you. 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 This is Martin Van Nostrand. <laughs> what are you doing here? Do you know each other? Wait a minute, I know you. You're the guy from the Calvin Klein underwear ad. That's true. <laughs> so, um, could watch that one forever. It's hard to even cut it because it's so fun to watch. Um, but there's a number of fun things happening there, of course. Um, they really do go on to cast the pilot and make it within the show, um, which is one of my favorite things. I just think it's really, really fun by the time 
that you're starting to really understand and get the feel it, feel for the show and love the show, they do this great, super self-referential whole elaborate storyline that takes, you know, a huge part of a season. And we have a number, of course, of um, future famous people there. Uh, Jeremy Piven, who does, I believe, go on to play George in the pilot, in the pretend pilot. Um, Mariska Hargitay there. And um, another really fun kind of corner of this is uh, Larry Hankin, who gave that great last audition, not Kramer himself, but, um, you know, the one right before Kramer comes in, he, Larry Hankin gives this great performance as Kramer. And he was actually somebody who was also up for the role of Kramer originally in real life. So they brought, brought him back to be the, uh, the fake Kramer in the storyline. And another thing is that um, that bit at the end where Kramer comes in and auditions for himself is close to real life because uh, there's a guy named Kenny Kramer who the role of Kramer was based on. He was friends with Larry David when Larry was writing the pilot. He did live across the hallway from Larry David in New York City and they had a very similar relationship. He is a pretty <laughs> relatively accurate um, depiction of this man in general. I have gotten to know him in my time. I interviewed him for my book and have done some events and things with him since. And he's really, really fun and very Kramery. Um, and he did, in fact, audition to play himself. Well, he didn't quite get to the audition stage. They didn't let him. He asked to play himself and they would not let him. So um, he did get something like $500 uh, for them to use his name, the actual Kramer. They tried some other ones and they just never quite liked it as much as Kramer. So they really wanted to use his name and kind of threw some money his way in order to, um, to do that with as little trouble as possible. Of course, no one thought it was gonna go on to be, you know, this huge, success that continues to this day. Um, so $500 seemed more than reasonable at the time. Um, so with that, I wanna move on to the fourth thing that they did to solidify their success. And that is that they grounded, this actually comes straight from what I was just talking about. They really grounded almost every plot line in real life inspirations. Then they kind of blew them up and got as weird as they wanted to. Um, in the early days, it was actually a, a hard and fast rule that if you were gonna, if you were a writer on the show and you were gonna pitch an idea to Larry and Jerry, it had to come from something that had originally happened to you and they would ask you about that. Um, and I think the idea here is basically like, if you start with some real, you know, like I said at the beginning, this is about real life annoyances, really. And so you want that feeling of identification with what's going on on the show. Now, of course, especially as the show goes on, it gets pretty wacky and that stuff doesn't necessarily come from real life. No one dropped a junior mint, for instance, into an open body cavity in a hospital. Um, but, you know, the idea was you start with something that could really, that really happened and then take these things to, you know, an insane conclusion. So George's neuroses tended to come from Larry David himself. And the two shared many, many escapades, including the time when George quit his job dramatically, regretted it over the weekend, and then reappeared at the office the following Monday, acting as if nothing had happened. Um, Larry David really did this at his job at Saturday Night Live. Elaine and Jerry, you know, when we first meet Elaine, we, we learn that they used to date and um, are now good friends. And that was something that Larry also took from his real life. He had a similar relationship with a woman named Monica Yates, who was the daughter of the novelist Richard Yates, who wrote Revolutionary Road. And Richard, in fact, served as the model for Elaine's very cantankerous father, who we only get to meet in one episode, but it, it is truly one of my favorites. It's the one called The Jacket. And uh, Jerry and George are forced to kind of entertain this extremely 
grumpy, masculine, older man, um, and it goes very poorly. So that is based on Richard Yates and Larry David's experiences with him. And as I mentioned, the character of Kramer came from Kenny Kramer, Larry David's neighbor. And this leads to a number of pretty mind-bending uh, crossovers, I guess, between real life and fiction. So we're gonna watch a couple of, um, couple of clips here. And the first one is actually another real life character who they brought in to, um, as an inspiration for their show. And the crazy thing is that this is Jay Peterman. So we're about to meet him. And um, this is a situation where it was several seasons in already and they just thought the actual Jay Peterman catalog, which is a real thing that existed. It still does, I believe. I haven't checked really super recently, but it has existed until recent times, I'm sure. And um, was really, really big in the 90s. You'd get, the, get it actually in the mail. And it was very entertaining. And the funny thing was it kind of had this aura of like, you know, great adventure and this really flowery prose that would, and then these little stories even that would illustrate something as simple as a jacket, but they'd have a whole story about the Italian countryside and things like that. And it gave this air of like, you know, Jay Peterman is this world adventurer type. And Jerry and Larry loved this idea for a character and they actually just used his real name. And this time, unlike with Kenny Kramer, they did not even check with the real Jay Peterman who is a real person. Um, and they did not give him $500 even, which is pretty bold, but they were counting on the fact that they were the biggest show on television and that this would be good publicity for him regardless. So we're gonna watch um, that right now. This is the introduction of Jay Peterman. the best way to get some place you've never been. That's true. Have you been crying? Yeah, you see, this, this is one of the manicures. Oh, no, no, it does us a That's a very nice jacket. <laughs> very soft. Huge button flaps, cargo pockets, drawstring waist, deep by swing vents in the back, perfect for jumping into a dock. You know all that. That's my coat. You mean? Yes. I'm Jay Peter. <laughs> <laughs> then in the distance, I heard the bulls. And I began running as fast as I could. Fortunately, I was wearing my Italian cap to Oxford. <laughs> Sophisticated yet different without making a huge fuss about it. <laughs> Rich, dark brown calfskin leather, matching linen vamp. Men's hole in half sizes, seven through 13, price $125. Oh, that's not too expensive. I like that shirt. Where did you get it? Oh, this innocent looking shirt has something which isn't innocent at all. Touchability. <laughs> Heavy, silky, Italian cotton, a fine, almost terry cloth like feeling. <laughs> Five button placket, relaxed fit, innocence and Mayhem at once. <laughs> it's not bad. So that is how uh, Elaine comes to work for Jay Peterman for a while, and he is a major character on this show. And um, this has this long and complicated kind of history and continues on and it influences the business of Jay Peterman and all kinds of things, which you can learn about more in my book. Um, but I think it's super interesting and this interplay between reality and fiction just gets deeper and deeper, deeper as Seinfeld goes on 
Um, I even saw a lot of people online when I was doing research who didn't realize that this was a real thing. And when they found the catalog site, they thought it was a joke. They thought it was like, you know, a joke about the Seinfeld character when in fact it is a real thing where you could buy real things. Um, so it's pretty crazy. And this next clip that we're gonna watch is another level of that because um, what happened was that you need to know a few things before this makes any sense at all. Um, as the Jay Paterman character goes on, um, he eventually wants to write a biography and uh, really, what we learn is that he actually is not this international man of mystery. He has very few interesting stories. And so he actually ends up buying some stories from Kramer, who of course has tons of great stories because he's a real international man of mystery. And this is also around the time, stay with me, where in real life, um, Kenny Kramer was looking for ways to profit off of the fact that he was the real Kramer. And he started a bus tour. And when the writers heard that the real Kramer had started a bus tour of Seinfeld sites in New York City, they were like, well, our pretend Kramer has to, ha has to do this. Our fictional guy has to do this because it's perfect for Kramer. So this is where they actually end up combining this Jay Peterman story about um, Kramer giving him life stories to use and this bus tour in real life. And this is where we get Kramer's bus tour, which we're going to watch now. Hey, Jerry! I'm starting a Peterman reality bus tour! Check it out! <laughs> The last thing this guy's qualified to give a tour of is reality. <laughs> hey, what were you doing with that bus yesterday? Here you go. Here you go. Check it out. <laughs> the real Peterman reality bus tour. I'm confused. <laughs> the Peterman book is big business. People want to know the stories behind the stories. Nobody wants to go on a three hour bus tour of a totally unknown person's life. I'm charging $37.50, plus you get a pizza bagel and dessert. What's dessert? Bite-sized Three Musketeers. <laughs> Just like the real Peter Man eats. He eats those? No, I eat those. <laughs> I'm the real Peter Man. <laughs> Wait a minute. I think I understand this. Jay Peter Man is real. His biography is not. Now you, Kramer, are real. Talk to me. But your life is Peter Man. Now, the bus tour, which is real, takes you to places that, while they are real, they are not real in the sense that they did not really happen to the real Peterman, which is you. I understand. Yeah, it's $37.50 for Three Musketeers. <laughs> Pizza bagel, you really shouldn't use cinnamon raisin. You also shouldn't use a donut. Gentlemen, welcome to the Peterman Reality Tour. Turn music off. We just go. And go, we will. What is this? It's a pound cake. Well, we have a bonus ultra-reality stop today. We're going to be hauling muffin stumps to the local repository. We're going to a garbage dump. And we're off. You know, I never thought he'd be able to recreate the experience of actually knowing him, but this is pretty close. <laughs> So that is the Kramer reality bus tour. Um, I will tell you a lot of, some of those details are real, including the 3750 ticket price, which has remained that way um, up until recently. I don't know if he's doing tours right this second, but Kenny has been continuing to do these tours throughout the decades. And I have to tell you that even as a person who knows a ton about Seinfeld, obviously, um, I was in the middle of writing my book when I went on this tour and I thought, there's no way this is going to be that much fun for me. There's like, I can't learn anything new. And Kramer, Kenny is just so fun and has so many great stories and he is so entertaining. And so if you ever have a chance to catch this, um, it is really quite fun, no matter how much you know about Seinfeld. And he will not give you 
pizza pound cake. I promise you. Um, usually there's like a soup Nazi stop and that sort of thing. So it's very, very fun. And it's a much nicer bus too than the one on the show. But starting with these real life inspirations gave Seinfeld some of its best moments and, um, you know, really allowed them to have this kind of grounded feeling, no matter how crazy the twists and turns ultimately became. And you can see how by the time they were doing episodes like the clip we just watched, I mean, it's so complicated. This is also the episode where uh, Elaine starts selling muffin tops because those are the best part, but she has to get rid of the stumps. So she sends them on the reality bus tour to the dump. Um, so lots of things happening by this time. It gets really crazy, but because they start with, um, you know, something that is remotely realistic because it really happened, they can go anywhere they want. And I will tell you, even Festivus was real. I'm going to show you the clip about Festivus, this uh, made up holiday first, and then we'll, I'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, what? Nothing, it's a card from my dad. What is it? <laughs> Dear son, happy Festivus? What is Festivus? It's nothing. It's nothing. When George was growing Jerry, up, no. his father no. hated all the commercial and religious aspects of Christmas, yeah. so he made up his own holiday. Oh, and another piece of the puzzle falls into place. <laughs> all right. And instead of a tree, didn't your father put up an aluminum pole? Oh, Jerry, yeah. stop it. That weren't there feats of strength that always ended up with you crying? I can't uh, I'm going to my you happy now? <laughs> <laughs> So I will just tell you very briefly that, like I said, even Festivus is real, believe it or not. Um, this was one of the one of the writers. Dad actually made up a holiday called Festivus. Um, a lot they added a lot to it in terms of you know once they used it on the show. But when uh, Jerry heard that someone had made up a holiday, he thought, well, this has to go in the show. There's just no way this doesn't go in the show. And of course, it has to be George's because who else's father would do such a thing? Um, but I, I recommend that is another one where I will say I recommend uh, checking out the whole story, which gets very complicated um, in my book. So I want to move on to the um, final and kind of the most important key to Seinfeld's longevity, which is that they created extremely distinctive moments, images, and especially catchphrases. And I experienced something while I was working on the book that really kind of brought this home. Uh, the Brooklyn Cyclones, who are a minor league baseball team, started having Seinfeld nights several years ago. And they are really this whole scene. Um, I went to the very first one, which I was lucky enough, it happened to be like right when I was researching the book. And it was amazing. Um, you know, there were Vandalay Industries t-shirts, tons of people wearing puffy shirts like the one Jerry wore. I had a really funny interaction in the bathroom that I know was not planned uh, to be on theme, but they did in fact run out of toilet paper in the uh, women's bathroom and people were of course joking about Elaine's line about can you spare a square. So it was just this constant kind of like, it was so much fun because you could just go around saying these lines to people, you know, to anyone. And the idea was that they're all fans and you would, everybody would understand what you were doing. Um, and one of my favorite things that they did, they had all of these different kinds of things uh, going on, but one of kind of the most distinctive ones was that they had a, um, an Elaine dance off. And so just, to fully appreciate that, um, just imagine lots of women in sort of like flowy 90s dress, flower dresses, um, you know, clunky shoes, big hair, full Elaine look, and they were doing this, which we will watch now. All right. Who's dancing? Come on, who's dancing? You want, me, you want me to get it started? I'll get it started. Yeah.
it's most. That is the Elaine dance. Um, another one that was inspired by, by real life events as well. Um, somebody had a boss who really danced like that and that boss was Lauren Michaels from Saturday Night Live. Um, so, you know, this is like, when you think of things like that, people can just sort of toss this off, right? And say like, oh my God, they dance like Elaine, um, which kind of means it's very embarrassing and weird. And all of these women who came for the Elaine dance off at the Brooklyn Cyclones game knew exactly what that was supposed to look like. And so did the whole crowd. There was also a special guest who brought food with him. And I will play a clip instead of telling you the name of that character. <laughs> Medium turkey chili. <laughs> Medium crab bisque. <laughs> Didn't get any bread. Just forget it, let it go. Excuse me, uh, I think you forgot my bread. Bread, two dollars extra. Two dollars? Everyone in front of me got free bread. You want bread? Yes, please. Three dollars! <laughs> no soup for you. Uh, shh, I gotta focus. I'm shifting the soup mode. Oh, God. Good afternoon. One large crab bisque to go. Right. <laughs> Beautiful. You're pushing your luck, little man. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Hey there. Um, uh... oh, 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 one mulligatani and um, what is that right there? Is that lima bean? Yes. Never been a big fan. <laughs> um, you know what? Does, has anyone ever told you like exactly like Al Pacino? You know, son of a woman. <laughs> Very good. Very good. You know something? <laughs> Not so for you. Come back. One year. Next. And that is the soup Nazi. Um, I feel like the quintessential one of these. This is the character, the uh, the catchphrase, everything going on there. At this game that I went to, um, some of the other big reference points were they had a junior mint toss, they had a marble rye fishing contest, and of course, many more. And they've done several of these nights since then. So they keep coming up with new things. And this show is so full of these little references and little inside jokes that you can kind of go almost forever. And you know, these are Seinfeld and nothing else. There's nothing else like Seinfeld. And even though many have tried to duplicate it, it's just impossible to do. And this is why I think Seinfeld fandom remains so strong. Um, Seinfeld fans really speak their own language. No soup for you, real and spectacular, master of my domain, yada, yada, yada. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, these are you know, things that kind of entered our lexicon and may never leave. Sometimes people use them without even realizing what they're from, you know, um, that is how strong it is. And it looks really simple, you know, this show in retrospect, but like I said, it can't be duplicated and there's a reason because, you know, Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld really uh, followed their creative instincts and made this very special thing that cannot really be duplicated and I think that is the real secret to its success. So I'm gonna end there. I don't know if we can take questions. I'm happy to if anybody has any, otherwise we can wrap it up there. <laughs>